This growing organism is considered the world's oldest intoxicant. Yeah, right there is the Amanita. Mm -hmm. It predates alcohol by 10,000 years, yet not many use it anymore. The big question is why not? Today, Jonas and I are on a hunt for Amanita muscaria, which is arguably the most famous mushroom in the world. I think everybody should know a lot about it. And if you don't, well stay tuned, because by the end of this, you will. The fly agaric. If you're unfamiliar, well, the Smurfs live in one. And it is the famous Mario Brothers mushroom that helps Mario grow and get more powerful. And this is more than just a fairy tale. It is mushroom season in Sweden. And this is like a short wall into the troll forest. It's like dark and dense. Now I saw my first one 20 years ago in Alaska. And the owner of the hostel I was staying in told me a story about it. It went something like this. It's the powerful psychotropic mushroom of the reindeer herders from Siberia in Northern Europe. You see, the reindeer can't get enough, and by feeding it to them, they dance and jump about as if they're flying. The cultures would pick the mushrooms in the fall, dry them in the spruce trees, and then the shaman of the tribe would distribute them as presents over the winter solstice in December. From there, they'd all partake in the mushroom and laugh and be joyful, rest and be merry. And if the snow was heavy, well, you couldn't go through the door, so they'd come in through the roof. I had never heard any of this, but I could see how people could make the connection between this mushroom and the legends of Santa Claus and the flying reindeer. But it didn't stop there. He said the mushroom had multiple compounds in them and the body would convert the bad chemicals to the good. And here is the weird part you don't hear in holiday stories. Apparently, you can collect the pee of both reindeer and people who had eaten the mushroom to, uh, how do we say this, recycle the chemicals. Ew! That led me to research it a lot. I actually studied it in grad school when I was in Hawaii as well, doing an ethnobotany program. And it's because it has these unique chemicals within its tissues. And I'll get to all that in a sec. First, let's go find the mushroom. <laughs> And of course, there's not just Amanitas. We're finding all sorts of other mushrooms in this forest. One of these kind of unwritten rules that you don't tell people where they are and you don't even ask people where they are because you know they're not gonna answer you. I should note here that maybe the best thing about learning about the fly agaric 20 years ago was that it instilled a deep interest in learning about fungi. Well, that's a very cool one. This is the inky cap. Drink alcohol, they're poisonous. Finding edibles. <clears throat> My dad used to love picking these. And do mushroom time lapses. Here we go. Turn on. Every two minutes. Now I want to note that this mushroom is mycorrhizal, which means that it forms a relationship with the roots of the trees around us. Now not every tree forms mycorrhizal associations with fungi. Spruce does. And uh, they're also very specific sometimes which mushrooms are which. You gotta look around and see which trees you're in. This beautiful spruce forest is a great place to find these. You can also find them in birch and in pine. So it's kind of cool because the mushroom is helping the plant get nutrients and in exchange the tree through its roots is giving sugars to this this beautiful mushroom. Of course most of the mushroom is underground. It's a mycelial mat and then these little things are just the fruiting body. These are like the fruits. You don't see them all the time, but the mushroom mass is all underground all the time. Even though this mushroom is highly psychotropic and actually amazingly safe if prepared right, the real danger is mistaking it for something else. Fortunately, this is not a hard mushroom to identify. Okay, let's talk identification. This is an Amanita. Other Amanitas include some very deadly and toxic varieties like the Destroying Angel and the Death Cap. In other words, you need to know at the very basics how to identify an Amanita. So if you look at this one, you can see it has this ring around. It's like a little skirt around the stalk or stipe as it's called. That is where the cap used to be connected. And then other Amanitas will also have a bulbous base. So they have a vulva around the bottom. Now, and that's why when you identify them, sometimes you'll want to dig it down a little bit deeper and cut it out because you don't want to mistake it for anything else. Now, on this particular one, you have a red cap. That's very distinguishable, but sometimes I've seen them yellow or yellow-orange. 
and then you have these little white flecks on the top and those are a remnants of when it used to be a little tiny growing mushroom like a little egg like thing and then as it grew uh, that that container just separated and you, you remained with that in fact we saw some over there and you can very easily see how it started and why these flecks look like they do now now the chemistry if you know a bit about mushrooms, you may know that some amanitas are very dangerous. The biggest danger comes from amatoxins. These mushrooms, along with a few others, contain the compounds that are responsible for 95% of mushroom deaths. Amatoxins, you see, cause acute liver and renal failure. In other words, we stay away from any mushroom that has these in it. However, amanita muscaria does not contain amatoxins. Instead, it contains isoxazole toxins that can cause alterations to mental status, but no liver or renal injury. Thank goodness. Now here's what's interesting. The two main compounds are ibutenic acid and muscimol. Look how similar they are. Some people consider ibutenic acid to be the bad compound because it's the one responsible for nausea, vomiting, and a really uncomfortable experience. Muscimol is often considered the good one, and that might be oversimplifying it. But given that ibutenic acid can cause some sickness, we'll go with it for now. Through a process called decarboxylation, you can convert ibutenic acid to muscimol. You can first dry it between 165 and 195 degrees Fahrenheit to convert about 30%. Adding an acid like lemon juice converts more, and fermenting it in milk and yogurt that has bacteria could convert over 90%. So interestingly, the name fly agaric comes from the fact that people reportedly added it to milk for what everybody thought was to kill flies. My suspicion is that they were actually trying to convert ibutenic acid to muscimol so they could ingest these mushrooms and the aggregation of flies was just a byproduct. Oh, wow. See, that one has a little bit of the yellowy orange on mm -hmm. the cap. Mm -hmm. Oh, got, wow. Got a, a young, young one, that one that just came up over there. At this point in the video, you might be wondering, what does this mushroom do? To understand that, I talked to Amanita Dreamer, an expert on this topic. In doing so, I realized this needs an entire video, which I'm exploring in the next episode. But the short is that in small amounts, it acts a bit as a sedative and can be very relaxing and calming. Yet, please note, I am not encouraging any experimentation. But this tidbit was fascinating. I think it's the limitless drug. And if you take it in the right doses, you will see for yourself that it is. I've been on it, I know what it does. Because my mission with this channel is to help rekindle an appreciation for things our ancestors once knew, this statement by Amanita Dreamer really seems to point to why we don't use it much these days. Through attrition and generation after generation, the knowledge got lost. And now there's this resurgence of mushroom knowledge and trying to learn again not to fear mushroom medicine. You just prepare it properly and it could be the best medicine that the world needs. Amanitas are here. So as I lay in this Scandinavian forest looking face to face with the fly agaric, I think I finally figured out why it isn't used much anymore. It's not because it's actually deadly, and it isn't because it has no useful compounds, it actually does. Instead, it seems that our fear of other mushrooms and a general lack of societal knowledge about what you can and can't eat has led us to be overly cautious. Look how cool this is. Fortunately, we are in the resurgence. And if you care about this, you can also be very happy that we are rediscovering and hopefully taking advantage of, in a healthy way, the medicine that comes from this the Mario Brothers mushroom, known to us now as Amanita muscaria. Before I end this episode, I want to throw to what I'm doing next week, which is I'm here with Amanita Dreamer. We have dried Amanitas, and we are learning all about the misconceptions of this mushroom. So stay tuned for that. I hope that you're learning through this series things that you can uh, better appreciate in the great outdoors. Uh, we wrote a book recently called Mother Nature is Not Trying to Kill You, which has this exact same theme. The fly agaric is in the book. You can actually pick it up if you go support us on Patreon for cheaper than you can get it on Amazon. That's one of the perks that we have over there. I'm also doing postcards. The Amanita mushroom is one of the ones that I'm doing uh, for the next series. So that might be something to get before Christmas. Uh, also, that book is a fantastic thing for kids. That's uh, kind of why we wrote it. Until next time, stay safe. Enjoy the woods. Bye.